Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Build Your Practice Through Blogging, presented by Cordell Parvin. My name is Stephanie Phelan, I'm a marketing manager at MyCase and I will be your host today. First, I'd like to give you a few tips about participating on GoToWebinar. The webinar control panel is on the right hand side of your screen. This is where you can control audio, chat with me, and submit questions. Please use the questions pane to submit your questions at any time during the webinar. I'll be collecting those questions and saving them to ask Cordell at the end of his presentation, but please don't wait until the very end to shoot those over to me. Also note that these slides and the recording will be available by end of day tomorrow on the MyCase blog, and it will also be emailed to all registrants. When you close your webinar today, a very quick six question survey will pop up. All you have to do is answer those questions and you'll be entered to win an Apple TV. You have a great chance of winning, so it's definitely worth it. And if you'd like to join the conversation on Twitter, the hashtag to use is hashtag lawyer blogs. Um, I'll chat that out to everyone too. This webinar has been approved by the Wyoming State Bar and the Florida Bar for one hour of general CLE credit. If you are a Florida Bar member, note course number 2407R to self-report your CLE. I will also send this information out in the GoToWebinar chat pane. Today's webinar is hosted by my case, so before we jump into things, I'd like to give you a quick overview. My case is a web-based law practice management software that takes care of your daily practice requirements for calendaring, contact management, document management and templates, time and billing, client communications, custom workflows, and more in one solution at an affordable price. My case is priced for solo and small firms at just $39 a month per attorney and $29 a month per paralegal or support staff. We also offer my case websites for our customers. The cost to set up and build your website is only $500 and then there is a $50 per month maintenance fee. If you've looked into building a custom website, you'll know that this is really a super deal. We use a modern and professional design for your firm. The websites contain social media and blog integration, so you'll all learn how to blog today. And best of all, a client portal which is completely integrated with your MyCase software. So now you and your customers can log into MyCase directly from your website. Next up is payments. Are you accepting payments from your clients online yet? You really should be, and it's easier than ever. MyCase recently announced the addition of a built-in credit card payments feature to our payment service. MyCase customers can now accept online payments from clients using both credit cards and checking accounts, also known as eCheck or ACH payments, seamlessly through their MyCase account. No third-party integration required. Last but not least, we enjoy hosting educational events for professionals in the legal industry, and that's why we're all here today. So let me tell you a little bit about our presenter. Cordell Parvin practiced law for more than 36 years and developed a highly successful construction law practice. During his career, Cordell was a rainmaker and taught, mentored, and coached young lawyers on their careers, work-life balance, and rainmaking. In 2005, Cordell left the firm so he could work full-time coaching lawyers. Funny story, Cordell was hired by a national law firm to go across the country to their various law offices to speak on blogging and social media. The intention was to encourage their senior lawyers to contribute content to their practice area portion of their firm's blog. Cordell is convinced that he was selected for the job of luring senior lawyers towards technology and blogging due to the color of his hair. Well, I know that Cordell can teach all lawyers, regardless of age, that want to learn top tips for blogging for their firm. So Cordell, I leave it to you. You can take it from here. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh before we get to blogging, I want to take each of you on the call into a coaching session I had in 2011 with a, a lawyer here in Dallas. We were in my office and the lawyer was telling me how hard he had been working and how, how much he was doing and how much non-billable time he was spending <clears throat> and it really wasn't paying off for him. So I asked him, I said, well, give me some examples of what you've been working on. Well, he had worked on a couple of law review articles. And I said, well, I think it's great to write law review articles. I, I wrote one myself way back when. 
but I don't think it's great in terms of spending time on client development necessarily to write a law review article. Then he described going to a uh, networking event, and I said, well, how much time did it take? Well, it took him 30 minutes to drive from his office to where the event was. The event itself was over lunch. It was an hour and a half, so that's 90 minutes, and then it took 30 minutes to drive back. And I said, well, how was the event? And he said, the problem was most people at the event actually wanted business from me rather than could possibly afford to hire me as, as a lawyer. So we sat down, and I don't have slides in this, but I want you to, if you have a pen and paper, I want you to actually uh, write this down, and Stephanie can share with you later two slides that will mem memorialize it for you. I said, <coughs> Sean is the lawyer's name, I said, Sean, uh, client development principles are these. You have to be visible to a target market, and you have to be credible to that target market. That leads to what I call weak tie relationships who are out there recommending you. Once you get recommended, you're going to, going to eventually have a client meeting, and those client meetings, it's all about trust and rapport. And then the second thing I had him do, I said, Sean, take a piece of paper, Make a line straight down the middle from top to bottom. Make another line straight across, right in the middle. You have four quadrants. The first quadrant, I want you to write the words high return, low investment. The second quadrant, I want you to write the words high return, high investment. Now, for me, a law review article was a great return, but it was an incredible investment. In the bottom left, I want you to write low return, low investment. And in the bottom right, I want you to write low return, high investment. And I, Sean, I want you to take those that upper left, high return, low investment, I want you to do it early, do it often, do it again, do it whenever you have a chance. And by the way, blogging for you, for him, could be one of those things. So Sean created a blog, his blog is has really launched his practice. He has an incredibly successful practice, has been interviewed by the Wall Street Journal, been, speaks all over the country, and it all started with that blog. So Stephanie, we're gonna talk uh, about a survey questions for people, and the question is just simply, do you have a blog? Yeah, so if everyone can just go ahead, everyone should have a poll on their screen. Um, do you have a blog? And you can select yes, no, or no, I had a blog and I quit. Um, so Cordell, everyone's putting in their answers right now, so I'm going to allow them another few seconds for that. And the majority has voted, so I'll close the poll. Okay, and our, our results are already in. Um, so 32% said yes, they have a blog. 62% said no, so hoping to learn from you today, and 7% had a blog and quit. So I'll go ahead and hide these. We'll bring your slides back up. Perfect. Okay, so those of you who said no, uh, I'm not saying that all of you should have a blog. I, I think that some practices lend themselves better for blogging uh, than others, and and some circumstances lend themselves better for others. But at the very least, and I'm so glad you signed up to be part of this, at the least, I want you to have a better criteria to decide whether that would work for you. So what is a blog? I, I like to say it's a conversation with your reader, like we were having coffee, uh, sitting across the table from each other. And I, I would sometimes add it's a trust-based conversation designed to build designed to build trust and rapport with your reader. And so if you think of it in that context, it's not like writing a brief for a judge. It's not like writing a detailed contract. It's a conversation, and it should be in a conversational type of tone. So you have to think of who your audience is, and I see three distinct audiences, clients and potential clients, social media shares, and, and uh, referral sources. Those are the three intended readers. So I, I see a lot of blogs. You know, uh, there must be thousands now of, of law blogs. And I have to be honest with you, I think most of them aren't really as good as they could be. 
and I don't think that some of the lawyers blogging, I can tell when I look at the blog, I don't think they're blogging with a purpose or a strategy. So if you, if you think of your blog in this way, anytime you're going to post something, who is your intended reader? Why should the reader care about your topic? What's the reader takeaway? And what do you want the reader to think of you and your firm? So that's the starting point for blogging with the purpose or blogging strategically, is to think of it in that context. The second thing to think about is don't bury the lead. I may even have another slide on that. Write like a journalist because a very high percentage of your readers will never get to the end of your blog post. And you have to give kind of a hook somewhere in the blog to get them to the end. And I'm going to show you some examples of what some lawyers that I've coached have done on, on that regard. But keep in mind, the, they're going to look at your headline, they're going to look at the first sentence, they're going to look at the first paragraph, and they may not go any further. So those are really important. You're, you're, I see a lot of lawyer blogs that for lack of a better term, I, I would call it a, a journalistic kind of thing, talking about a case or something that's happened in the news. Your, your readers are looking for more than journalism. What they're looking for is, is, again, trust and rapport, your judgment, your expertise, your take on it, etc. So how do you pick a topic? Uh, you know, when I was writing I wrote a column for Roads and Bridges magazine for over 25 years, and the starting point that I had for picking a topic was simply to look at the billable work I was doing, and if there was not an ethical reason or a business reason, then that was the starting place for me to look. <clears throat> Clients care about problems, opportunities, and changes. And if what you're writing is not addressing a problem, opportunity, or change, it's very unlikely they're going to take the time to read it, even if it's short. So here's our second poll. Where do you find blog topics, those of you who are blogging and those of you who have blogged? It can be your billable work, case decisions, the news, or other bloggers. Okay, great. So if everyone can please make their selection there, um, billable work, case decisions, the news, or other bloggers for your inspiration, and everyone is now voting, please go ahead, cast your vote. I'm going to be closing the polls in just a moment. Okay, looks like majority has voted. I'll go ahead and close. And the results are in. Uh, so where do you find blog topics? 18% said billable work, 27% said case decisions, 44% said the news, so that's definitely our majority, and 10% said other bloggers. I'll go ahead and hide those results. That's, that's really interesting. For those of you who said the news, um, I use something called Flipboard. I use uh, Hootsuite. I use various things that search terms uh, to bring the news to me. It, it's so amazing how easy it is to get get that news sent to you rather than to have to go out and find it. So I, I mentioned I use Flipboard as an example. Uh, you, you, in the search part of Flipboard, you can put, in my case, I would put construction, highway construction, airport construction, rail construction, and infrastructure, and then that's just an easy way for me to get the news. I also used Google Alerts as a source of, uh, again, when, if I put highway construction in the search query, I'm going to about, I would say, at least nine out of ten things I'm going to get will be just absolutely irrelevant. But if I get one out of ten that's helpful, then that's going to work for me. Okay, so let's, we, we're talking about, uh, the blogging strategy, we've talked a little bit about where you find the source of information. I, I have lawyers I coach who, who seem to think they run out of sources of information, so I'm glad a lot of you are, are using the news. Now let's talk about the essential ingredients. 
when I'm teaching lawyers that I coach to blog, I, I ask them, I said, what, what's the most important words in the blog? Where's the location of them? And not everyone knows, but the headline is the most important. And among other things, you want to have what I call a magnetic headline, a headline that causes people to want to read further. Uh, but also you want to have a Google searchable headline. If someone did a Google search for the legal topic that's in your blog post, you want them to find your blog and you want to be on the first page of Google on whatever that topic may be. <clears throat> so here are examples of a headline. Uh, of, I coach Jay O'Keefe, a lawyer in Virginia who writes an appellate law blog. And so his, what he likes to do is make, make his headlines something that he believes will attract uh, readers to go further. Now, I don't think either of these headlines are great for Google searchability, but they're great for people who may not be that interested in appellate law to read further. <clears throat> Again, here's another one. If if I if I were an appellate lawyer, or I was an in-house counsel that's going to hire an appellate lawyer, or I was a trial lawyer who didn't do appellate work, I think I would want to know these three ways to handle the hardest parts of arguing in the Fourth Circuit. But again, not, not so Google searchable. Okay, so uh, Hayes Hunt's a lawyer that I coached and crime fraud exception. So if someone's doing the crime fraud exception, they may likely find his blog. So it's pretty darn good on the front of searchability on Google. So once you've got a great headline, and again, is your headline aimed to get Google searches or is it aimed to attract a good attention? Open with a bang. Again, don't bury the lead. <clears throat> and so the most important part of a Fourth Circuit brief, so you can open with a question. Uh, and, and again, you won't see a lot of that in newspapers, but this is a great way to open a, a discussion and want people to read further. You can share an anecdote. <clears throat> now, two really important words is you and because. And by the way, if you're sending your blog to clients, potential clients, referral sources, if you're sending it by mail, the link, in the email you want to say, I think you will find this valuable because. So you and because are still really important words to use in the blog itself. I, you know, when I did writing for Roads and Bridges, uh, which in that day I think would be as close as you could come to a blog, it was a one page uh, a month article that I did, 675 words, which would be a little long for most blogs. But I never used you and because. I, uh, I thought that would be way, way too informal. But I think if I was writing it today, I would still consider using these words uh, and changing it up a little bit. Okay, you need to have good sentences, and good sentences in a blog should be relatively short sentences. <clears throat> I'm, I think a lot of people, my construction clients, if there are any construction lawyers on this call, my construction clients would say to me, Cordell, I don't want to know the history of Swiss model watchmaking, I just want to know what time it is. So give me a list, give me bullet points. And I think a lot of your readers in the blog post want, just want bullet points, want a list. Uh, blogs that are outside of the law that tend to be most read, uh, many of them are lists of things, 10 things you need to know about X, whatever X happens to be. Uh, and so brevity I think is important. I uh, I coached a firm where one of their blogs, the typical blog post was as long as 3,000 words. What I tried to share with them is no one's reading 3,000 words on their screen of their computer, much less their iPad or their iPhone or any other device. <coughs> so I think you need to get to the point. Now, if you want to put in 3,000 words, put an active link in the blog post to that longer document that you want people to read. 
exquisite subheads. Um, I'm not an expert on SEO, search engine optimization, and, and Google, but I do know that Google searches the headline and then searches subheads if you have a if subheads. Now, if your blog is 600 words in that ballpark, I think you need some subheads. So here's some exact examples of lawyers who are doing that. And again, so John, who's writing this blog, he wants people searching goodwill to find the, the blog that he's writing on this particular subject. Readability. I don't know about you, but when I get uh, a screen that's full of words and not a lot of white space, it's really, really, really hard for me to read. And so think of your readers in that regard. My, my blog posts are short. You can see this in this post right here. Lots of white space, short. I, I try to make my blog's uh, post paragraphs be two sentences uh, rather than more. <coughs> Excuse me, you can see also the bullet points. Make sure and have active links. Again, Jeff who writes this blog post has short sentences, short paragraphs. He includes images. I include images mostly uh, to break up the text in terms of the appearance of the blog post. So this is, I think, is a good example of, of those kinds of readability questions. Tell a story. I don't want to bore, bore you with my story, but I've been working on a novel for a couple of years. And and in a, obviously a lawyer novel. I don't really wouldn't know how to write much of any other kind of novel. But what I've learned in that process is the importance of story. And and even when I wrote the column for Roads and Bridges magazine, I put it as a story. Uh, you know, we go to movies, we read novels, we love stories. And so I think your blog can be used to tell a story. Some of the lawyers that I coach really, really do a good job on that. And so I, I created this on Pablo, uh, and I don't know if any of you have used Pablo at all, but, but Pablo is part of Buffer. And so I just put my, my own quote here. My favorite law blog, blogs do not report a case. They tell a story to the reader as a conversation. So I hope you're doing that. So uh, Hayes Hunt, who I mentioned earlier, showed you his blog. He, years ago, way back in 2011, he wrote this uh, blog on legal ethics, and it was Client Cost, Litigation Expenses, Ticket to Toledo. And by the way, I, I put, I've been blogging since 2006. Uh, I think the most comments I've ever gotten on a blog are maybe five or six at the most. He got 33, I believe, comments on this blog. And by the way, at the end, uh, you can't see it on the screen, he said, for those of you who are wondering what a mud hen is, the AAA baseball team in Toledo is the Toledo Mud Hens, here's what it is. And he went on to explain. So again, look at, look, he's telling a story. He, and he's changed the name of the airlines to protect the innocent, so to speak. And, and, and then he's coming down and he's, talking about the legal ethics rules that apply to his question. He also tells a story here, usual stipulations, deposition mythology. And again, he's talking about his own first deposition. It's a story. It's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I'm not that interested in usual stipulations, but I'm going to read about it because of the way he's presenting it. I'm a big fan of what I call internal cliffhangers. Uh, when you're reading a novel, and I've, you know, obviously I've learned that writing a novel, you want someone at the end of the chapter not to be able to put the book down and go to sleep. And I think the blog's the same way. You want them to come back to your next blog post and the one after that. And, and you can do that when you have internal cliffhangers. Uh, so <clears throat> this is an example. Weird, and Anne Marie is a lawyer from Omaha. Weird and wacky coverage cases, say it isn't so. And 
you can see how she starts out. And again, her this is so conversational. When I when I first read her blog post, uh, she sent it to me in a Word document before she actually went live on her blog. I said, Anne Marie, you don't talk this way. You know, write your blog as if you're talking to your reader, and and you and some people would find this uh, to be not formal enough. Uh, and, and but I think this just is really shows Anne Marie's personality. I think you need to have images. Use images there. I'm going to show you some free places to get images. So here's an example of a lawyer I coached from North Carolina, and I think this is actually one of her photos that she took herself. And so uh, she's beginning again this blog post. She's a construction lawyer, as you can tell. But she's beginning the blog post with the story about her husband traveling the back roads between Chapel Hill. <coughs> uh, so here's another example of an image. Uh, and Jeff, who writes this California employment law blog, always has some really interesting images. You know, there's so much video out there, if, if, if appropriate, and if and only if appropriate, Include a short video clip. I was I was coaching a family law lawyer, um, and we were talking about a blog post that he wanted to write. And the blog post was to the effect: What if what if your spouse's lawyer and your lawyer are big pals? Is that a problem? Well, so I he said I can't figure out how we could use any kind of video in that blog post and and I, I found for him a, a very short one minute clip from the movie way back with Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn where they are opposing lawyers in a criminal case it's kind of a comedy but they are both they both play lawyers well that video clip he was able to insert that in the blog post and and uh, because they're arguing with each other and so forth made it a little more interesting. Close in style. Uh, I mentioned earlier that, that m many readers, maybe even most readers, don't get to the end of the blog post. And so what you want to do is, is find a way to cause them to want to get to the end. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. <coughs> Anne-Marie, uh, she usually ends her blog post with what she calls the bottom line. And an, another example here, here, you can see this blog post by Gray Reed and McGraw here in Texas is meant to be relatively humorous. You can see from the caricatures. And, and what they do, uh, you can see from the first paragraph, they make up names of, of companies and people and so forth. And so the, the beginning is meant to be humorous. And they really do a pretty good job of it. And I, I think they get a lot of readers be, because of this humor. I, I, uh, I'm anxious to read their blog just to see what they are up to next. But they always end it with tilting the scales in your favor when they talk about the legal point uh, and you can see, I love the white space. I love the fact that they've got bullet points. They've got an active link uh, to a previous blog post. So they are causing readers to want to get to the end because the readers really, the takeaway for the readers is the tilting the scales in your favor part of their blog post. So another one I, I, I coached. Mike Smith, who's the lawyer with Cousin O'Connor up in New York, I coached him many years ago when he started this blog. And every blog that he writes, he ends with the employer takeaway. And so again, the, the magic for whoever's reading it, an employer, is to get to that point of what the takeaway is. And this is where you're getting beyond the journalism uh, aspect of blogging. So I hope those give you some good examples of what some lawyers are doing. What, one thing, if, if you're going to do something like this, 
I like the idea of using the same words each time and bolding them. So tilting the scales in your favor, employer takeaway or Embree's bottom line, because readers get familiar with that and they look for it. So I, I think you can use the same words. Be authentic. Um, you know, we talked earlier, and I, I told you that you'd be able to get a slide. Visible, credible leads to weak tie relationships. But when you get to the very top of that scale of getting hired, your potential client is judging you in terms of your trust and rapport. Trust is, can I trust this lawyer to do this legal work? Rapport, on the other hand, is what's it going to be like working with this lawyer? And I think the blog is a place to show a little personality, to, to give a sense of who you are. And and now, for each of us, uh, we're different. You know, some of us are introverts, and 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 we really wouldn't share very much information. Those the others of us are extroverts. So. You have to be authentic about it. You can't, you know, be one thing and write as if you're another. But I just want to show you a couple of examples of people who I think are doing that. Uh, show some emotion. So uh, Charlie, Kevin O'Keefe from LexBlog, who has spoken to your group here before, uh, and LexBlog, by the way, is the platform I use for my blog. But uh, Kevin is writing about a lawyer that I coached in Dallas named Charlie Sarton, who is uh, an oil and gas lawyer. And, and what he's complimenting Charlie about is uh, Charlie's showing some emotion in his writing. Uh, again, with Charlie, when he first started blogging, he brought in these Word documents and and uh, wanted me to review him before he went live on the blog. And I said, Charlie, uh, no one's going to read this. It's, it's just boring. And, and I know you. I've worked with you. I've spent time with you. You're not boring. And if, if you get a chance, you know, go to Gray Reed and McGraw. Go to his oil and gas blog. And for the last couple of years, most of the he, – he loves music. And, and and most of his blogs, he ends with what he calls a musical interlude, interlude with a link to um, either a video or an audio of, of some music point that he wants to make that connects with the blog. So Jay O'Keefe, who I showed you before, he did this one. I, I really enjoyed it. Day in the life of an appellate lawyer. And, um, you know, it's kind of tongue in cheek. What he, he starts out by talking about his dad being a tax lawyer in New York who retired and he had no idea what his dad did. And his brother, Patrick, also didn't know what his dad did. So what he's doing, he's writing this blog for his children to, so his children have some idea of what a day in the life of an appellate lawyer is like. But what he's really doing is sharing with potential people who would hire appellate lawyers or the Virginia Supreme Court clerks and others who would read this blog, you know, what his day in the life is like. So there's kind of a tongue in cheek, there's kind of a uh, something kidding for his children, but it's also for the intended reader. <coughs> I coached a lawyer, Dave Walton, in Philadelphia, uh, who, if any of you have read, read Adam Grant's book, Give and Take, if you go to the fifth chapter, it's all about Dave Walton. But Dave Walton is someone who grew up stuttering, and so after the King's Speech came out, Dave Walton wrote, wrote this blog post because the King's Speech dealt with stuttering. Well, I mean, this is really personal stuff on, on his, in, you can see in law school during my first mock appellate argument, I remember being exhausted and I stuttered a lot more than normal. So in this blog post, he's writing about how he overcome came the, the stuttering issue and he, he's been an incredibly successful trial lawyer. Now, 
I think this raises a, another point that I think is really effective in blogging, and, and that is to take something and compare it to something else. So in other words, we're taking a movie here, and then we're bringing it back to us and, and in this case, Dave Walton's same issue as what's in the movie. So I might find something in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Dallas Morning News, a movie that just came out uh, that ties to what I, the point I want to make. And so then I'll try and make it. I coach a lawyer uh, who's, a, those of you in Wyoming, in Wyoming on the call, she's a member of the Wyoming Bar. And uh, she writes a blog on energy. And I discovered in my time with her that she loves baking. And so she is, in the last month and a half, she has posted two blog posts about energy, but tying it to something to do with baking. And uh, I just find that, uh, to me, this is the most interesting blog post she's written. And interestingly enough, she's gotten more hits on Twitter, she's gotten more views. Uh, just because of tying those two things together, tying an interest she has with with the, the energy market of what's going on. So each of you has a unique perspective. Um, you know, don't try and repeat what someone else is doing. Seth Godin, one of his first books, I hope, hope all of you, by the way, subscribe to Seth Godin's blog, G-O-D-I-N. Seth Godin wrote a book called The Purple Cow. And the essence of what he's writing is your blog should be a purple cow. It should stand out from the crowd. It should be different than other bloggers. It should give a different perspective on whatever that legal issue is that you're writing. It can't be one of 40, 50, or 60 writing on the very same topic without giving a unique, different take on whatever the topic is. Again, your voice, connect with your readers, let them know who you are. I've given you some examples of that. Logistics. Uh, people ask me all the time, how often should I blog? Well, uh, what I would say is as often as you have quality material that you can write in a, an effective way to attract the interest of readers. I coached a lawyer in 2008 who, when I started coaching her, she didn't even know what a blog was, much less what Twitter uh, was. And But she started writing the blog uh, literally five days a week. And she got so good at it. I mean, she was on the first page of Google. If you, if you searched her practice area of law, in Google, anywhere in the United States, she was on the first page of Google with that blog, and partly because she was posting as often as she was. But what, what I really want to talk to you about here from a logistical standpoint is make it consistent. And in other words, don't post a blog in January and then four months later post another one. There was a very large... Uh, New York-based firm that started an M&A blog. And so in January, they announced the M&A blog. In February, they posted something on the M&A blog. And then uh, they didn't post anything else till April. Then they didn't post anything till like October. And you know, I'm thinking to myself, they're actually doing themselves a disservice by that. Or if I go to any law firm uh, website, and then I, I click on the blogs, and I go down the blogs, and no one's posted in a year, no one's posted in 18 months, no one's posted since February, which obviously less than a year. I'm wondering if they're really serious about it. I, if it were up to me, I would take down the blog rather than have people see that you're not posting regularly. Uh, those of you who read my blog, uh, over many years, I posted five days a week, and uh, more recently, I've been posting two days a week. And I, you know, after posting now for ten years, this is my tenth year. It's hard to it's hard to get new ideas, so I'm I'm posting a little bit less than than I was previously. 
Okay. So here's your third and last poll. Uh, how often do you blog? Those of you who are blogging or those of you who blogged in the past, you blog daily, weekly, monthly, or whenever you have time. Great. Now, so last poll, if everyone can go ahead and select your response, uh, daily, weekly, monthly, or whenever I have time. I'll give you just a few more seconds, and then I'll be closing the poll. All right, looks like majority has voted. I'll go ahead and close the poll. And our results are in. So very few, 2% said that they blog daily, 18% said weekly, 19% monthly, and 61% whenever I have time. I'll hide those for you, Cordell. Wow. Um, I, I would encourage those of you who are blogging whenever you have time to make time. Uh, I, I coach a lot of lawyers, and, and I've, I've coached well over a 1,000, as you saw on the slide. And it's not unusual for someone to say to me, Cordell, uh, I haven't been able to find time to do X, whatever X is. In the, and in this case, blogging. And I, I tell them, I said, well, you're using the wrong verb. <laughs> you don't find time. You'll never find time. You have to make time, carve out time. I want to give you a, a concept to be thinking about that many of the bloggers that I coach use, and they find it really effective. There's a professor at Columbia named Heidi Grant Halverson who wrote a book, wrote a very short ebook, and actually you can get it as a Harvard Business Review PDF, uh, very short, called Nine Things Successful People Do Differently. And I urge you, if any lawyer on this call, I urge you to read it. It's well, well worth the two minutes or whatever it will take you to read it. One of the nine things is the concept of if-then planning. When I was uh, practicing law, if I was in Dallas, I was up at 4.30, coffee in hand at 4.45, and I was at Cooper Aerobics when it opened at 5, and I was at my desk downtown in Dallas at 7. And I never one time in all the years, never one time did the alarm go off at 4.30 and I say, oh, I just don't feel like it today. It was if-then planning. If I was I've traveled so frequently, but if I was in Dallas, I was up at 4.30 and so forth. When I was a junior lawyer, uh, I, I, with a, a daughter, I, I discovered that my best client development was 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. And that's when I would do all my writing. That's when I would prepare presentations. That's when I would do my research for my writing. Now, why did I pick 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. on Saturdays and Sundays? My wife, Nancy, was usually working out at that time, and my daughter, Jill, was rarely awake before 9 a.m., and, and she's in her late 30s now and still rarely awake before 9 a.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. <clears throat> so figure out what's best for you. I've coached two tax lawyers uh, who both had spouses, wives who were resident doctors, and they both had children. So you can picture what a day in their life was like taking care of the children as well as their legal work and, and so forth. So for each of those two, they did blog posts uh, after the children were asleep. Usually the young, children were young, so it was before 9, 9 p.m., but that, that, that was the if-then planning for them. So I hope that's helpful for you. I, I just urge you to be consistent. Uh, uh, I, uh, I also always have a backlog of blogs uh, that I can post when, uh, when I get busy with other things. Uh, that also raises another point I think is really important for you to know. There are two kinds of blog posts that you might be posting. One is time sensitive. You've got to get there first and get it out today, that case that just was decided yesterday or whatever it happens to be, time sensitive. 
but a very large majority of blog posts you could be writing are not time sensitive. So put those in in your the back part of your blog post to post when you get busy with billable work. I hope that's helpful for those of you who uh, chose whenever I have time. So again, I think do it regularly and consistently. So if, if you're going to do it once a week, do it once a week. Do it on the post it on the same day so people come to expect it. You know, the analogy I like to use is if I subscribe to Sports Illustrated magazine, which comes out every week, and all of a sudden for a month I didn't get any issues, I think I would be pretty upset by not getting the issues. Okay, some other logistics. I think that um, it's a really great idea to think about getting your clients and referral sources to do guest posts on your blog. Now, there's a variety of reasons this is a good idea, but not the least of which is to get more readers. In other words, they're going to share the blog post with, with their friends, colleagues, connections, etc., and you may get more readers that way. Second, you're kind of boosting them, so uh, you know they're they're going to look to return the favor in some fashion if 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 this is they view this as an opportunity. So consider doing that, and it's you know one blog post that you don't have to write other than the introduction. So Jay does a good job of that. He's had actually had more than one uh, guest post on his blog. I coached a lawyer. Uh, up in Montreal who tried an incredibly big, long, took forever case. And I was struck by the fact that his entire trial team did the entire case with an with iPads on their desk, not a computer and not paper. And so uh, that that lawyer actually did a guest post on on Jay's blog on how to try a case with an iPad. I mentioned earlier sources of images. Uh, I've used my own. I've actually taken a post-it and written things on it and made that a visual. More recently, uh, well, previously I used iStock and Shutterstock, which you pay for. But more recently I've been using Pexels, and, and there's some others. Uh, Pablo is another one. There are a variety of places to get free images. And of course, you have to size them correctly for your blog when you're, when you're inserting them in, into the blog post. Share. Use all the share opportunities you have. And by the way, this is a really good, anyone interested in learning more about social media and blogging, this is a really good website for you to, and blog uh, post for you to take a look at. But so here's an article they wrote on how to boost your content reach with social media. I uh, think it's important within the first 24 hours that you do that. And by the way, you should be on Google Plus. And Google Plus, uh, if you share it on Google Plus, you're going to, for the first 24 hours, go up in the search engine optimization. Uh, some people I know, including Sean, who I mentioned earlier, uses Hootsuite, I, I have, have used Hootsuite. I more recently have been using Buffer. And what I can do is I can share it. Like my, uh, some of you may have read my blog today. I posted it at 6 a.m. Central Time, and it went out to all the social media sites at 10.45 Central Time because Buffer timed it to do that. So those are good share opportunities. You know, here's Sean, by the way, and his old old blog post. And you can see at the bottom all the various ways he has that people can share his blog. Okay, so for more information, um, and I think Stephanie actually has the links to these that she can share with you, but I, I did a, an, an e-book that you see on the screen that's available both on SlideShare and iTunes, and Stephanie again can uh, give you the links to those. So, yeah, actually, Cordell, um, if I can just interrupt for a moment, though that um, social media book is contained in GoToWebinar as a handout, so everyone can just download that directly from their GoToWebinar control panel. Good. So, 
So I think we've finished in time, Stephanie, to get some questions. Yes, great. And we have some really wonderful questions that I'll get to in just a moment. Um, but for those of you who have to leave us now, please take note of three things. When you close your webinar, a quick six question survey will pop up. All it takes is answering those questions and you're entered to win an Apple TV, so it's definitely worth it. Um, if you're a Florida Bar member, I chatted this out, but last chance, note CLE course number 2407R so you can self-report your CLE. You will all receive an email tomorrow with a link to the My Case blog where you're going to find these slides, the webinar recording, and the Apple TV winner. Um, so moving on to those questions. Um, a few people asked, how do you draw attention to this new blog? That's a, that's a great question. Um, first of all, I would send it out by email to, to um, people you really know well. I, I divide people, I, I used the term earlier, weak tie relationships. You know, you have strong tie relationships, uh, but send it first to your strong tie relationships. Ask them to share it with colleagues and friends or people in the industry. Uh, if you have an industry practice, I had an industry practice, I would send it to the executive directors of the state, federal, local associations, in my case for contractors, and ask them to share it. Uh, social media, you know, one, again, one reason to get a guest post is that's another way to get more readers. Uh, but, but, you know, you're going to start start small. Those of you on Twitter, uh, I don't know how it's been for you, but it took me longer to get from zero to 250 followers on Twitter than from 250 to 2,500. So you just, you have to start and just keep on going and hope people are retweeting it and things like that. Include a visual uh, on Twitter and, and you increase your chances of having someone retweet whatever it is you put on there. Good answer. Um, next question. Should there be a call to action at the end of the blog? Like if you're facing a legal issue like the one discussed here, call us today? Well, I don't like that at all. I, that reminds me of the guy trying to sell me a car. And, um, I, I, and also I think it, it cert, in certain states it may create all kinds of ethical issues. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't do that at all. You know, uh, there, <clears throat> if, if your blog, identify a problem, offer a solution. Well, identify a problem, prove the problem exists. Identify a solution, prove the solution works. By implication, you don't need to say, call me. You're demonstrating you're the person to call. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay, next question, Cordell. Is there a best day of the week to send posts? And is there a best time of day to send the post or to, to post the blog posts? Oh, I love these questions. I, uh, there's, some, there's some website that I signed up for. I paid some money for a while. And what it told me was the best time for me to put something on Twitter was 2 in the afternoon central time. I have no idea why. Still don't have any idea why. I, uh, you know, I'm posting two days a week now, and I've chosen Tuesday and Thursday over the other possible days. I think Monday and Friday are probably the least best days to post. I, do, I don't, I, I could search for that on Google and see if someone agrees with it or not, but I just think that uh, Mondays and Fridays, people's mind is in a different place. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, okay, the next question. Should I be blogging on my firm website, on Facebook, or on a separate blog hosting site? I know you kind of addressed this at the beginning, but a few people did ask this question again. I, uh, I have a Facebook coaching page. <clears throat> some, some of you maybe even signed up for it. So, you know, I keep my personal Facebook page separate from my Facebook coaching page. Um, I, you know, the, the law firms where I'm coaching, I don't think any of them have lawyers blogging 
on their own page. They're all part of the law firm. In fact, some of the law firms on each of the blogs that the firm has has the firm name in the URL for the blog. So I think you're going to find that. Now, having said that, those of you who have that question, uh, you know, LinkedIn has its own blog platform. And, and so if your firm would give you permission, you know, that's another potential place to be putting a blog that would be not on the firm page. Okay. Very good. And this may be the last question. Um, now, a lot of people asked about images before we had that slide about source of it, of sources of images, and I did chat out all those images um, to everyone, the sources for everybody. But people wanted to know, so... Um, if using images, kind of talk about when using images, should we credit the photographer um, or the reason, really? The reason mm -hmm. I use Pixels and Pablo and there are a few others is you don't have to credit the photographer. And so I coach some lawyers who are using some site where you have to put credit underneath the photo, and I think it distracts from the blog. So I used. I mean, I I, prou I can't begin to tell you how many images I I have uh, on my computer because I download them all the time. Shutterstock, for a period of time, had a thing where you could sign up for a month and download 25 images a day for 30 days. So needless to say, I got 25 times 30. Um, I get a I get another uh, one on the list that I. I had on the slide, but I get an email every two weeks from a source that has uh, photogra really incredibly fine photographs. I'll send Stephanie the link to it because I can't remember it right now. But anyway, really fine photographs that cost nothing and you don't have to give any attribution. Okay. Great. And I know that we did talk about frequency um, just to, to keep it consistent, but a few people are asking, is, is blogging once a month frequent enough if they're consistent with doing it once a month? Well, let's, the second part of your question makes the first part better, but I think once a month's not enough. Out of sight is out of mind. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay, great. Um, so one more question, and you can tell that this is a webinar for attorneys. Do you put a disclaimer on your blog? Some states, I think, may require it. Um, I, I, I don't know which of those states, but some, in some states may require that it, 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 that it have somewhere that it's an advertisement or whatever. So, I'm, you know, each state's different in terms of what the ethics are. Uh, you could do a whole program on ethics of blogging, but if you start with the general, what the general ethics rules are, they don't change just because it's a blog. Okay, great. And would you suggest the use of infographics on blogs? Uh, someone needs to explain to me what that is. Just kind of like a graphic portrayal. Um, I, I saw that you use some cartoons, maybe, and images. They're asking I, about, um, like, kind of, yeah, I, an I animated image. Mm -hmm. This is just personal taste. I don't like cartoons. I like real images, and, um, and because I, you know, there's a, you know, there, there's a set of images, and a lawyer I know used. The, the images look like the Pillsbury Dope Boy or whatever name that was, um, and they're and they're meant to be relatively humorous. Um, I don't like I don't like that very much. Uh, Jeff, who I showed you, who had the little boy with the construction helmet, uh, he likes to use children, and there's you know several of the image opportunity places have all kinds of humorous children and so he's doing a labor and employment law blog and he's found that to be something that's connected with his audience. Yeah, 
Great. Um, well, Cordell, there's there's lots more questions pouring in, so a lot of engagement with this webinar, but we have run out of time, so we'll have to cut it off there. And um, Cordell's contact information is there if you would like to reach out to him, and my case's information is there as well. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and thank you, Cordell, for the excellent presentation. We'll see you all next month for next month's webinar.